tell you about one of the greatest weddings in American history. What? What does that have to do with the show? You'll see. And can that really live up to its billing? Uh, certainly one of the most patriotic. Okay, and then uh, also a little bit later in the program, um, what else do I have for? Oh my god, a Republican says the most devastating things about uh, Trump. I was actually shocked at what he said. So that's coming up in a little bit. But I look, I told you guys that we won the uh, streamy uh, for best news show on Sunday night. Um, well, we're up for uh, show of the year, best show on the internet tonight. But you can still keep voting uh, today. So uh, you do that through hashtag tyt for streamies. Just uh, tweet that. Tweet anything else you like with it. Tweet nothing else if you want. Uh, retweeted that also counts. The last day of voting. It's panic time. Go for it. And then twenty and then tonight. Uh, watch ceremony, see if we would also, Anna and I will be presenting the Storyteller of the Year. Uh, a really great category that includes DJ Khaled. Okay, I don't know how to say it. How do I say it? Anyway, I better figure it out before the ceremony. Twitter.com slash uh, streamies. Brett Ehrlich is going to teach me for this before the ceremony. All right, let's get started. Uh, let's go to Sean Hannity, okay? This is one of those uh, stories that's just nothing but fun, okay? Uh, it's about Sean Hannity. Uh, he apparently got jealous of Lawrence O'Donnell's outtakes. So someone leaked uh, that uh, he's got his own. Uh, this is well, uh, what happens during the show when they're going to a video clip. And then this is what he does while the audience is watching the video. Harry Shearer got his hands on this. He apparently has a source inside of Fox News. This is fun. Now, first of all, this story was going to be nothing but fun. I actually didn't have anything to say about it until Hannity responded, so i got to now respond to his response. But first, let's watch him vape. Watch that. All right, there he goes. Okay, looks like the penguin there a little bit. <laughs> okay. Depends on your take on it, you know? If you're a smoker, you might find it uh, not so bad. There he is, that stern look. Doing the Marco Rubio. No problem. A little scratch there. Maybe work with the earpiece. And game face, go! <laughs> okay, really no big deal. Okay, so he apparently vapes. What's in there? Yeah, America wants to know. Okay, we might not find out. Uh, presumably tobacco. So Hannity then tweets out in response to this, LOL, which is appropriate. It's, it's not real. Uh, enjoy as advertised on my radio show. I don't smoke cigars anymore. Well, I don't think anybody thought that it was a cigarette. It, it looked like he was vaping the whole time. Um, and hence the graphic. Uh, so, but okay, that's fine. No, so far, still no story. It doesn't even look that bad. It's kind of funny, but it's not that it's no big deal at all. Then he says this, now, I had to give them up, uh, even during golf and fishing. Ugh. And I drink beer and occasionally vodka. I know liberals never do either. Ugh. Oh, of course! Liberals also drink beer and vodka and do many other things. But the difference between you and us, Sean, is that we don't judge you for it. So that's why I don't care that you're vaping. I don't even care if there's weed in there. Yeah, I won't get into the weeds on the story, but... <laughs> anyways... We actually want to leave you alone. Uh, we're not in favor of big government like you are. We think you should have personal liberty. And if you want to smoke or smoke cigars or vape, have at it, Hoss. We're not going to judge you on that. But uh, but you guys are the ones who are constantly like, don't do that. Don't do this. So in this case, no one knows what was in it. So overall, though, Sean, am I not merciful? Not guilty. And if you were guilty... I'd pardon you. Most reasonable man in America. <laughs> okay, we're moving forward. Just a quick little fun story. Okay. Um, hashtag TYT for streamers. Did I mention that? <laughs> All right. Uh, 
Now, let's go to healthcare. Um, wait, I have news on this, so I should do this, okay? We have news! <laughs> Alright, alright. Uh, repeal and replace, dead again! I know it's a zombie bill and it keeps coming back up, but they had until September 30th to somehow figure out uh, how to get 50 Republicans to vote for it so they don't need Democrats. Well, it looks like it is not going to happen. Mitch McConnell came out and said, uh, yep, uh, we just couldn't do it. Couldn't get enough Republicans to vote for it. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office, which is nonpartisan, had come out and said, yes, it will still uh, cost untold millions of Americans uh, health care coverage. And yes, it'll be more expensive. And yes, it'll cover less. <laughs> Pretty much disastrous news, which cost some Susan Collins, as you'll see in a second. Uh, and so let me give you the details on how this one is dead. Uh, the decision to shelve repeal legislation came during a weekly caucus meeting uh, on Capitol Hill as leaders acknowledged that the latest proposal from senators... Uh, so they did not uh, bring it up for a vote because all that would do is cause further embarrassment since they don't have enough votes. And McCain might come back out there and go, which was super fun for her. Okay, uh, so uh, the reason Senator Bill Cassidy, who was the author of this particular legislation, had to say this is because Donald Trump sometimes doesn't know how things work. So he said, quote, we don't have the votes, which is the most obvious thing in the world. Uh, but uh, so Trump, <laughs> after one of the first efforts to get rid of Obamacare and failed, was like, I don't understand what happened. Why didn't it pass? And then he was like fuming about the filibuster. The filibuster has nothing to do with this. Filibuster is 60 votes. This would have actually been a loophole around the filibuster. You just need 50 votes, which is not even a majority. My like, Pence would break tie and, and then you would get it passed, but you couldn't get a majority. You couldn't get 50 votes. So uh, Trump says uh, that he's very disappointed by a couple of senators, Republican senators, you know, he loves to hit his own side. Again, strategically, that might make sense in some cases. It hasn't in this case. If somehow he was playing three-dimensional chess. <laughs> I'd love to see Trump just play chess. What, what, what are these things? What do you call this castle? Why does it only move that way? Anyway, uh, if he had been playing three-dimensional chess, well, checkmate, I guess. He had no strategy. So let me give you more on Trump bashing other Republicans, which is always fun. He said, we were very disappointed that they would take the attitude that they did. We don't know why they did it. You can sort of figure that, but we'll see what happens. At some point, there'll be a repeal and replace, but we'll see whether or not that point is now, or will it be shortly thereafter? We are disappointed in certain so-called Republicans. Ooh, shots fired. Okay. Now, he apparently can't figure out why they voted this way. Actually, it's very, very clear. Uh, Susan Collins explained that, well, the Congressional Budget Office, the CBO, came out with the numbers saying all these people would lose their health care coverage. Uh, furthermore, uh, you and I go to the Hill, uh, she cited the CBO score uh, as one of her reasons for opposing the legislation authored by GOP Senators Lindsey Graham and Bill Cassidy, while also criticizing its cuts to Medicaid, its weakening of protections for people with pre-existing conditions, and predictions by insurers, hospitals, and other groups that it would lead to higher premiums and less coverage for people. Well, that's apparently why they did it. <laughs> that's why they didn't vote yes. That seems like ample reason, but Trump's still trying to figure it out. He's like, oh, nobody can tell. Nobody knows. Healthcare is complicated. Nobody knew that. And so I, I don't know why they voted it. They voted no because it's a terrible bill! Because it makes it more expensive, covers less, and more people lose their insurance, and the list goes on and on. Uh, but you think they're gone? They're never gone. So Lindsey Graham says, quote, we're coming back to this after taxes. Uh, what he means by that is they are going to try to pass a multi-trillion dollar tax cut for the rich. That is their number one priority has always been. Uh, this health care bill, the real reason for it was that it had about a six to seven hundred billion dollar tax cut for the rich. But that was an appetizer. Now they're going to try to pass a six to seven trillion dollar tax cut for the rich so now they're saying well maybe getting rid of obamacare costing you guys insurance by giving another 700 billion dollars to our rich donors that'll be the dessert rather than the appetizer wow i really look forward to that but one more thing if the trump is still flummoxed as to why 
politicians didn't vote for this horrible bill that he loved and supported. Uh, well, uh, if you look at the polling, CBS News had it at 20% approval. Well, that's pretty crappy. <laughs> 20% is a miserable number. That might be another reason why people looking forward to getting reelected didn't vote for it. By the way, Obamacare now polling at 54%. The more Trump and the Republicans attack Obamacare, the more people like it. They're like, whoa. Look, premiums are a little too high, but these people are covered, and if you have a pre-existing condition, they're not going to let you die anymore. Now that we've seen the Republican alternative, Obamacare looks way better. So, Donald, if you're still wondering and have no clue, which is usually the case for you, uh, as to why this didn't work and how it might work in the future, call me. I can let you know. By the way, one thing that does cover uh, everyone has lower premiums, and covers more uh, health care as well, gives you more uh, options, is a thing called Medicare. And luckily, Medicare for all, Medicare is so popular, it's polls of 77% of the people who, for the whole country, people who have it uh, generally like it, they, if you want more private insurance on top, you can get Medicare Advantage. So Medicare for all, saying, let us all into that popular program, is polling at 60%, the only thing higher than Obamacare. Because it checks off everything that Donald Trump uh, promised during the campaign. Of course, those relies on his behalf. It ticks off. Uh, it checks off every single box that Americans actually want in health care. Is this system perfect? No system's perfect. But overall, the reason why it's incredibly popular is because it works. Let's try that next. It's not that complicated. All right. Um, but good news today. Great news. Today. In fact, let me do. It's it's dead for now. So. It's dead, so it might mean that you stay alive. It is health insurance. That's how it works. Okay, so now I'm moving forward to uh, the NFL. I got more on the NFL in the next segment for you guys, too. But this is a great story. I love um, doing a little bit of uh, edification here on things you might not have known. I, I didn't know some, uh, a lot of this. Okay. <sighs> So Donald Trump, uh, of course, uh, continues to double down, triple down. I think uh, we're on quintuple down, actually. I think he went back at it for the fifth time today on saying that the NFL must make its players kneel uh, or not kneel or they should be fired. Uh, now this is the government basically saying uh, if they're going to exercise their freedom of speech or there should be consequences and punishment for it. It that is <laughs> at, at a minimum borderline unconstitutional. It's different if the owners do it, they're private entities, when, but when the government is demanding that people be fired, it becomes a massive constitutional issue, let alone the fact that these guys just, like, their cause is not that controversial. They want to end police brutality. Are there people for police brutality? Like, you might disagree about the severity of the issue, but, like, you're really that upset, like, oh, God, I really want police brutality to keep going. If only they could shoot more on our uh, men, and particularly black men. Oh. Again, you could disagree with it, but it's not an outrageous thing. They're not saying, hey, let's end all cops, or <laughs> whatever. It's just the most simple thing in the world. Can we look at, uh, you know, disproportionate police violence that happens from time to time and look to fix it so the police can serve our entire community? Okay. But there's a terrific article by Travis Waldron from HuffPost on uh, whether the NFL is political at all. Because a lot of the guys right now on the right wing are saying, including Trump, like, I can't get politics out of football. Why are these players bringing politics into it? Come on, man, I just want to watch football here. NFL doesn't have anything to do with politics. Really? So let's go to uh, Travis's really great article on this. He says, there is no such thing as a, polit as a politically agnostic NFL. An NFL we know today would not exist if there were. What's different today is uh, who inside the NFL is engaging in politics, how they're doing so, and what they are demanding. Well, that's an interesting thesis. What does he mean by that? How was the NFL political before? Well, he explains. In 1957, a full decade before the first Super Bowl, the NFL was still a fledgling enterprise trying to muscle its way to the front of the nation's sporting consciousness when the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that its methods of negotiating television broadcast rights violated antitrust laws. The NFL, in response, turned to Congress, a practice it would hone in years to come, and the league prevailed upon lawmakers to pass the Sports Broadcasting Act 
of 1961, a law that effectively invalidated the court's ruling by giving the NFL a limited exemption from antitrust laws. So the NFL was literally, in a lot of ways, especially on TV, born of politics. If they hadn't gone to Congress and lobbied and gotten politicians on their side, they wouldn't have had the broadcasting rights that they have. In fact, uh, it is, in essence, a, quote, government-sanctioned monopoly. So a lot of the sports leagues are, and they, and to varying degrees with slight variances, uh, and, and you could make an argument that they need to be, given their unique structure. But you certainly need politics to allow a monopoly like that to exist. So, But there's more. Uh, Travis explains, fantasy football, an unmistakable driver of the NFL's unrivaled popularity, is legal today primarily because the league successfully lobbied Congress to exempt the contest from federal laws that banned online gambling. Politics number two, at a minimum. More. The NFL over the last 20 years has also benefited from nearly $7 billion in tax subsidies that have helped its teams build stadiums that enrich its already wealthy owners. So, politics number three, that's a giant one. So, isn't that funny? When it's politics that helps billionaire owners, <laughs> go get them, NFL! Way to do that politics! When it's largely African-American players, now it has spread to white players, which is great, by the way. I love that they're standing in unison uh, and asking for reform and just supporting one another. <laughs> but when it spreads to, and it started with only African-American players, hey, hey, whoa, players! Politics is only for the owners. Okay. But there's more. Today, uh, as Waldron explains, the league has its own political action committee and has poached political communication gurus and strategists away from high-ranking political positions. If you got a pack, you might be a little political. Uh, it is literally called the Political Action Committee. Okay. The NFL, too, he continues, has allegedly used this considerable power to steer money away from certain federal government-sponsored studies into head trauma and chronic traumatic and so, oh, I'm not good at that, CTE, <laughs> the degenerative brain disease that has been found in dozens of deceased football players. So, now that one is alleged, but that would be uh, number four of political things the NFL does and that no one complains about, or not a lot of people complain about. Certainly the right wing doesn't. Okay, now. Uh, getting to the point here, he says, Today's most compelling political voices in football are not wealthy white owners in bad suits, urging Congress and state lawmakers to pass laws that further fill their pockets. They are black men in football uniforms who are demanding, right there in front of God and Jerry Jones and everyone, that football fans and Americans confront racial injustices that persist outside their sport but still affect them too. Uh, let me just have my first couple of disagreements with them. I think their suits are way better than mine. Uh, <laughs> they do have nice suits from time to time. And second of all, last night, even Jerry Jones, one of the most renowned, enormously wealthy owners in the NFL, the owner of the Dallas Cowboys, uh, took a knee with the rest of his players. I mean, if Donald Trump meant to unite people against Colin Kaepernick, he could not have failed harder. He united everyone all the way up to billionaire owners to do the same thing that Colin Kaepernick is doing. So, look, I think this is a brilliant point uh, by the writer here to point out that, no, the NFL has always been about politics. The question is who. And, and yes, last year, as Kaepernick and some of the other players started this, they were alone, and, and Kaepernick is still not in the league, so that action has not been taken. And that's ridiculous. Everybody in football knows He's one of the top 96 quarterbacks. It's preposterous to claim otherwise. So he should be in the league, and that should be resolved immediately. But And the folks who are enraged that players uh, actually have the temerity to ask for political justice on a really important issue are dead wrong. Uh, but overall, the tide, partly thanks to the miserable failings of Donald Trump, has begun to swing where people are saying, well, yeah, that's true, that's true, it is freedom of speech, and why can't they actually make their point about um, about police violence and well, whatever else they think is important? So uh, I love that, uh, that it has gone in the other direction, but it's important to know what the reality is and how politics has been involved all along. And I'm going to give Travis Waldron here the last word. He says, the players have not committed the sin of introducing politics into football, 
they're seen as to be black men talking about politics when the NFL wants them to shut up and entertain. Again, that was <laughs> before Donald Trump accidentally turned almost the entirety of the NFL uh, against him and in favor of Colin Kaepernick and the protests. Uh, but for a long time, the NFL was on the wrong side of this. And yes, they too play politics. So uh, apparently, literally in this case, two can play at that game. All right, we'll be right back.
A uh, couple of quick tweets. And do I'm making long rides in. Still less awkward than Hannity's MMA workout. Totally agreed. That was a hilarious video. Pat Trago says, hashtag TRT for streamies today and every day. That's right, except for the fact that after today, it doesn't really matter. Uh, so, uh, go vote right now. Hashtag TYT for streamies. That's T-Y-T-F-O-R. And then streamies. Uh, and you can watch us tonight on twitter.com slash streamies. Anna and I are presenting a award, and you'll see if we're going to win. Um, and that mole says Obamacare. If you strike me down, I will become more powerful than you could possibly imagine. I like the reference. Okay, uh, let's keep going. Let's go to Alabama. All right. Um, I'm already amused. Okay, uh, we've got an interesting race in Alabama that is happening today. Uh, they've got a primary on the Republican side. Jeff Sessions obviously became Attorney General, and they need to fill that seat. For the moment being, Luther Strange was appoint, uh, appointed to that seat in a very controversial way by um, a governor who had a sex scandal, uh, which Luther Strange was investigating, and then the governor appoints Luther Strange, and then leaves office and he's fine, and Luther Strange all of a sudden is not uh, investigating him anymore. So that's among, among the problems Luther Strange has, and the establishment has. It's scratch my back, I scratch your back, this is what people hate. So Luther Strange is an enormously right-wing Republican, uh, but that is one of his problems, and that's a fair problem to have. Another problem is that the guy who he's running against, Roy Moore, is an even in more insane right-wing Republican. So that's why Donald Trump was in Alabama giving that speech in the first place. Now, he didn't spend a lot of time talking about Luther Strange. He spent more time, of course, talking about himself, and then started that huge NFL controversy down there. Uh, he might have been a little bit uh, distracted or indifferent because of the latest polls. Every poll has his guy, Luther Strange, losing. Right now, Roy Moore is up uh, 50% to 40%. Um, and, and that's one poll we're showing you there, Emerson College poll, but all the polls have Roy Moore leading significantly. Luther Strange is the back is backed by the establishment, Mitch McConnell and uh, Donald Trump. Roy Moore backed by uh, the basket of deplorables, uh, Steve Bannon, uh, Sean Hannity, uh, and and all the other extreme right wingers. Uh, so, but by the way, no one's a winner in this race uh, unless somehow the Democrat pulls out a victory against one of these guys, and Moore is crazy enough, as you're about to see in a second, that he, he, he at least has a shot at losing, that's a pun as you'll see as well, unintended though, a shot at losing the, the general election race. Even Donald Trump knows it, in the rally where he was supposed to be uh, getting people excited about Luther Strange, he said, uh, quote, I might have made a mistake uh, polit politically in backing the under underdog in the race. He's such a clown. You know why he does that? He sees the polls, and he's like, well, I don't want my ego to get ruffled here, so I'm going to support him, but only a little bit, only a little bit, because, you know, I'm just, I mean, I, I don't want to take responsibility if he loses. The ego has landed in Alabama. So, apparently, Luther Strange has more money, is spending a lot of uh, that in ads. Roy Moore is aggrieved by this, because apparently someone questioned whether he's in favor of the Second Amendment. <gasps> Not in Alabama! So he is going to have this comical response. It's been very hard for my wife and myself to wither two, nearly three months of negative ads that we couldn't answer with money because we didn't have it. Ads that were completely false. That I don't believe in the Second Amendment. I believe in the Second Amendment. are bad that they kill. Well, I know a lot about guns. I'm the one that has used guns in combat. I know what guns do. Yeah, they kill people. What do they give out hugs? <laughs> the audience saw that in unison with <laughs> Yeah, he's got a gun! He could shoot any one of us at any moment! Or he could accidentally go off 
bananas. What? Yeah! <laughs> That's why this guy's leading. <laughs> only in America, brother. Only in America. Where your potential senator pulls out a gun and waves it at you. And you go, yes! Yes! I might accidentally get shot. <laughs> My lucky day. This guy used to be Chief Justice of the Alabama State Supreme Court. Uh, he lost that job because he refused to listen to the Constitution. He keeps wanting to put up the Ten Commandments everywhere, among many other things. He has uh, gone off on homosexuals in this country. He doesn't believe they should have the same rights. Okay, Roy Moore, if you make it into the Senate, we are ruled by a different document. It's called the Constitution. It's not the Bible, it's not the Old Testament. Yeah, you're not running for Pope. But the good folks in Alabama, at least on the Republican side, are apparently likely to put him uh, in a position where he might join us in the United States Senate. Well, God help us all. Luke Sullivan, who takes a knee, uh, the, should be fired and calls him son of a bitch, etc. The whole NFL, pretty much hundreds of players, and, by the way, coaches and now NFL owners uh, taking a knee uh, and, and joining in the protests uh, in response. Uh, but nonetheless, I was a little surprised by Steve Schmidt's reaction because it is so vociferous. So this is a Republican talking about this issue. Watch. And to see him try to hijack this symbol, to wrap himself in it for the purposes premeditatedly, purposefully, of dividing the country is the most disgusting thing I've seen in my lifetime in my 47 years. And what Donald Trump is doing here is, 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 is as terrible a thing and maybe the most terrible thing that has ever been done to this country by a president of the United States. Despicable doesn't begin to describe so I actually think that Trump's done worse. And and by the way, I think Bush has done worse in, in some ways. And look, the Iraq War killed hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians. Uh, so, um, But I, I love his anger and his rage at, at him uh, dividing us. And that's exactly what he's trying to do. You know, and, and here, Schmidt is going to get even more specific. Listen. I saw a handsome young man on TV, an NFL player. He got a little bit jammed up when the when the reporter asked him a question. Is he a racist? And he didn't want to say it. So let me say it. I want to help him out. He's a racist. Okay? You look at that speech in Alabama to an all-white crowd. Right? We, we need to get real about this in this country. The President of the United States goes down there. He talks about us and those people. He, he came proverbially as close as he could possibly come to shouting in a rally the N-word. That's what he did down there. I know it. You know it. Carol knows it. We all know it. And, and for, for the Republican Party and its leaders, but for every decent American, we're coming up on the line. We're enough's enough with this. Uh, what he's doing to the country is, is tragic. Okay, very strong words, which I really appreciate. Uh, but he's not alone. Uh, you know, a lot of people are shaken by this. Again, I think Trump's done worse. I think Trump's done way worse on the issue of race. Uh, you know, there's a thousand things that go into here. Birtherism, obviously, is a response to Charlottesville. Uh, let alone what he did with the Central Park Five, uh, five black kids accused of rape. Uh, and uh, he wanted them executed. It turns out later they didn't do it. Even after he found out they didn't do it, he still said they should stay in jail, which is just outrageous, and there's no reason for it other than race. And here Schmidt's pointing out, look, when you talk about us versus them, but not like a slip of the tongue, but you keep saying it over and over again, it, we know which direction you're going with this. This is not coded language. This is obvious language. And then it, later in the show, we're going to have a story for you guys, and if you guys don't know, Shows live every day, 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, check it out on you know tytnetwork.com or youtube.com slash tyt. And Anna's going to come later in the program and uh, and tell us about uh, a focus group that CNN did of Trump supporters. And one of them asking the question of, wait, why is Trump criticizing black NFL players way more harshly than he's criticizing neo-Nazis? He's very tepid after Charlottesville. 
But somebody takes a knee saying don't do police brutality and he comes at him guns blazing, son of a bitch should be fired and does it over and over and over again. So it, although there have been worse issues, I think what resonated with Steve Schmidt and a lot of the Trump voters here is NFL is a giant part of America and so they pay attention to that. And so when they saw him do it so publicly about such a big issue in their lives, it becomes a little harder to to turn your eyes. And, and it, I think that his issues with race became more obvious to at least more people in the country and uh, and Steve Schmidt just calling it out. And, and remember, he's a Republican strategist. So what he's trying to do there is not to do damage to the Republican Party. In his own way of thinking about it, he's trying to rescue the Republican Party. He's like, look, if we get stuck with this brand that we're the guys who are tepid about Nazis. We're the guys who uh, are the racists. That's going to destroy the Republican Party in the long run. And and I think he's trying to do the right thing and separate Trump from the rest of them. But let's keep it real. You know, the Republicans had 17 choices in the primary. They chose Trump. And yes, he hadn't made the NFL comments yet, but he'd made plenty of those comments earlier. He had started birtherism. They knew what they were getting. And so Steve Schmidt might want to also look at the Republican voters. But meanwhile, it is much appreciated that he had the courage to call it what it is. Okay, now uh, let's go to more anger on, uh, on TV here against Trump. So recently Donald Trump came out and attacked John McCain, even though McCain on uh, 60 Minutes recently said that his prognosis of, uh, is very, very uh, poor and he just flat out came out and said he has a high, very high chance of not recovering. And he said, look, I'm trying to enjoy a life well lived. So now Trump, to be fair, uh, before that interview, uh, had uh, gone uh, against John McCain quite uh, vociferously. How else does he ever do anything? But because McCain uh, indicated that he was not going to uh, vote for the latest version of uh, repeal and replacing Obamacare. Let me give you his tweets, and then I'll give you more recent stuff from, from Trump as well. And remember, this is just a couple of days ago from Trump. And everybody knew that John McCain had a very a severe case of brain cancer, even then. So he, he wrote, John McCain never had any intention of voting for this bill, which his governor loves. He campaigned for, on repeal and replace. Let Arizona down. And he goes on to say, Arizona had a 116% increase in Obamacare premiums last year. But the deductible is very high. Chuck Schumer sold John McCain a bill of goods. Sad. Now, don't ever trust any of uh, Donald Trump's numbers. I'm just giving you a sense of how much he's attacking McCain. By the way, Trump recently did a deal with Chuck Schumer. Sad. Uh, but, of course, he's nowhere near done. More tweets. Large block grants to states is a good thing to do. Also false. Uh, better control and management. Great for Arizona. McCain let his best friend, Lindsey Graham, down. When Lindsey Graham was asked about this, he said he can do any damn thing he pleases. He's an American hero, and, and he doesn't have to vote with me on my bill. Uh, obviously taking McCain's side over Trump's. Finally, Trump said Democrats are laughingly saying that McCain had a moment of courage. Tell that to the people of Arizona who were deceived. 116% increase. So mocking uh, McCain's moment of courage. Uh, then he went to uh, Alabama, had a rally, and and did a, a radio show as well, and kept on attacking McCain. Here's a clip of that. You know, you can call it what you want, but that was a, that's the only reason we don't have it, because of John McCain. Nobody thought he was a negative vote. Without John McCain, we have we already have the health care, and, and it would have been very good, by the way. So there he is on the Rick and Bubba show. Uh, then he's going to say it at the rally. Let's watch. They gave me a list of ten people that were absolute no's. These are 10 Republican senators. Now, John McCain's, John McCain's list. John McCain was not on the list, so that was a totally unexpected thing. Terrible. Uh, honestly, terrible. 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 Honestly. Okay. Uh, so, now, Joe Scarborough's going to go off on him. You, you know I'm not a big fan of uh, Scarborough. Uh, I think he's, of course, right in this case. Um, but what, to me, the most important part is not just about Donald Trump. We already knew what kind of a vicious jerk that he uh, is. Uh, Scarborough caught on to that fairly late, let's be honest about that. But he's definitely on board for that now. But it's also commentary 
on the Republican voters. First, let's get it started. I mean, you, you have no humanity. If, you have a, if a man who's, who's dying and you're using him for political punchlines on talk radio and also in audiences in Alabama. And by the way, for people watching at home, if you're in an audience and John McCain's getting attacked and he's fighting life, all right, unless you were raised in a barn, keep your mouth shut. All right? Show a little respect. Show a little dignity. Show a little class. I, I like how Republicans like Scarborough just realize who their voters are. Yeah, no, they, they you quartered these guys who are vicious. Uh, you did the Southern strategy. You, you, you use uh, dog whistle terms against African Americans for decades and decades, and then you've come to find out that your base is full of vicious guys who will boo a guy who is dying of brain cancer. Oh, uh, all are me surprised. Uh, well, turns out Scarborough at least is surprised. He's going to keep on going. A man who served his country in uniform when he could have done what Donald Trump did. Could have avoided the draft. His father was one of the most powerful men in America. He could have stayed home like Donald Trump, and he could have chased models. Do you have the character to do that? Mm. Oh, actually, if you boo John McCain, you've already answered that question. Someone has failed you in your life, and you need to examine that. If you still go to church, you need to pray for yourself this Sunday morning in church. And then when you get your head screwed on right, and you start putting humanity ahead of politics, against of stupidity, against of the tribalism that is destroying this country, then go home and tell your children the story of John McCain and what he did when things got tough. And how he put others ahead of himself, ahead of his safety, even ahead of his freedom, ahead of his life. If you can teach your children that lesson, maybe they will grow up to have a little more better than you. So look, I, I agree with all the things that he's saying here, uh, but you know, when he derives the tribalism, Trump didn't start that. I mean, Trump might be the culmination of that, but the Republican Party's been doing that tribalism for a long, long time now. And Look, you know, I, I often uh, criticize uh, Joe Scarborough for defending anyone in the establishment and the elite, and he's doing that here. But the guy's dying. So I totally agree with him that Trump has no bounds, and the people who are enjoying that and treating it like it's a wrestling match when a, a guy's life is actually hanging in the balance, uh, that is not the right way to go. And, yes, I agree they were not raised right. One last piece here. Well, it shows the extent of the nature of the party now that that's not what happens when John McCain gets mentioned at rallies by the president and his supporters. Like, Ooh. Yeah. Um, who, who, who raised them? Who raised these people? Because I guarantee you, I was raised in the same region, in the same socioeconomic background, going to the same Southern Baptist churches, going to the same public schools, going to the same public colleges, state schools that these people went to. So I ask, who raised these people? Who have they become that they would boo a man who is fighting for his very life? And has served the country. And days. has served this country in uniform, who is a prisoner of war for this country, who was actually told, you know what? You can be released from prison because your father's really powerful. He's a powerful man. And so just walk out of the prison. Go home. You can be reunited with your family. We'll stop beating you. We'll, we'll, we'll stop putting stars on your back. Go home. You will be freed. And John McCain said, for those of you booing John McCain right now and are too ignorant to read a book, John McCain said, no, I'm not going to go home. Until all my men go home with me. You should keep your mouth shut. Now, all that is true, but remember, Republican voters had 17 choices. They chose Trump. They're still backing Trump. 
So Scarborough is right to be mad at Trump. And to be fair to Halperin and Scarborough, both, both guys I criticize often, but they're pointing out here, it's not just Trump. It is also Republican voters. And that's the state of the party as we stand right now. Now, if they reject Trump later, maybe they are a little bit better than Trump. But for now, they're not. That's the Republican Party. All right. Uh, when we come back, um, what I would argue is one of the best weddings in American history. I'll tell you all about it.
Truth Control Left writes in, debate question for all future GOP debates, please list all ten commandments. Inconceivable they would get it right. You're absolutely right. Um, super last thing, which is an awesome handle on Twitter, uh, says he's trying to compensate, referring to Roy Moore, he's trying to compensate for a small gun with another small gun. Now, look, let me defend Roy Moore on the one and only thing I'll defend him on. When I saw that he had a small gun, I was like, well, maybe he's uh, secure in his manhood. It's usually the guys with the gigantic guns that have issues. Like, no, no, look at my gun! I got a big gun! I got a big gun! Anyway, uh, the one day jingle again says, only Donald Trump could get a crowd of people to boo a man dying of cancer. Uh, very fair. Uh, actually, super last thing. <laughs> Let me go to Jesse Topper from Super Chat on YouTube. You guys should expand overseas. There's a huge untapped market in Australia for Progressive News Network, especially in regards to politics. Jess, who says we're not? Oh, damn! <laughs> Australia, you're not coming for us. We're coming for you. But hold, hold. It's going to take a while. Okay? Let's go over here and finish up the show. Okay? Or at least the first half. Okay. <sighs> so last night we had another football game. Um, this is, of course, Monday Night Football. After all, the other games have been played. For those of you who don't live in America, but live in a box instead. Anyway, it was the Cowboys versus the Cardinals, uh, and Donald Trump was going to get in on the action and triple down on his criticism of the NFL. Of course! Of course he was! And then I'll tell you what Dallas did. He said, debooing at the NFL football game last night when the entire Dallas team dropped to its knees was loudest I have ever heard. Great anger. Hey. Okay. I heard it. It was definitely not the loudest I ever heard. It was definitely booing. They were in Arizona. <laughs> so, this is the worst talking point in American history. Like, when Steelers didn't come out for the National Anthem and they came out later in Chicago, where they were playing Chicago, the fans booed. That's because they're the opposing team. And the Arizona players were also locking arms. <laughs> so... That makes no sense. They were booing the Cowboys when they took a knee because they were the opposing team. And look, I grant you that some of them might have been opposed to the kneeling or whatever, but that wasn't the only reason why. Okay, so let's show it to you, by the way. Here's what it looked like. And uh, it was all the players, the coaches, and even, as you see right there, Jerry Jones taking a knee, the owner. The very, very wealthy, uh, uh, as far as we know, conservative, Chris Christie hugging owner of the Dallas Cowboys. Man, Trump is such a disaster. He got billionaire owners to take a knee in, uh, not necessarily in unison with, but in sympathy with Colin Kaepernick, who they were keeping out of the league. Man, you are an epic fail. You're a living, breathing epic fail, Donald Trump. So, and Jerry Jones was not the first to lock arms with his players. Shahid Khan, the owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars, Jaguars was, but he was the first to take a knee. Now, that what they did was they took a knee before the anthem, and then they went and locked arms during the anthem. So they're trying to have it both ways. That's okay. That's okay. I, I think, to me, that was it's a wonderful sign overall of not just unity, but saying, look, we're not just locking arms. We are, in fact, taking a knee, but we don't want to offend the people that think that it's the anthem is sacrosanct, and if you are in the wrong body position during the anthem, they're also going to get upset. Or maybe some of the players would also get upset, and you want to respect their thoughts and their rights as well. So, okay. So how does Trump take this? It's a double slap at him. Not only do they all take a knee, but during the anthem they also lock arms. So, no, 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 Trump has a different take on it. He says, but while Dallas dropped to his knees as a team, they all stood up for our national anthem. Big progress being made. We all love our country. <laughs> so he solved it. No, they took the knee against you. And they locked arms during the National Anthem against you. It's a sign of unity saying that what you're doing is unacceptable. It's not like they were locked, the whole league was locking arms before the national, during the National Anthem before you made your comments. It was only some of the players. And it was all it, as a show of unity for the protest that Kaepernick started. Now he's trying to twist it like, oh, yeah, well, during the anthem, the protest that they're doing, that was just, I mean, we're making progress. We're making progress. You are such a child, a sad, sad child, baby. Um, then Trump tweets, ratings for NFL uh, football are way down, except before the game starts, when people tune in to see whether or not our country will be disrespected. 
not worried about police brutality, not worried about African Americans and their their plea for justice here, not worried about the freedom of speech of the players or anyone else. What's the ratings doing? What's the ratings doing? And then, is it true that the ratings are up before the game? No, there's no evidence of that. Just made that up. It's like, oh, but I got good ratings. I got them good ratings before the game. Then they have bad ratings afterwards. Got you. No, you didn't get anybody. You're a fool. You turned the entire league against you. Okay. But he doesn't get it, man. He really doesn't. According to people who were at a um, gathering um, of right-wingers, he brought them in, uh, he was excited. He thought he was winning. It's like Charlie Sheen standing on a roof with a, a machete going, I'm winning, I'm by winning. Anyway, he told those uh, supporters, it's really caught on. It's really caught on. No, you schmuck, protests against you have caught on. You are so unbelievably dumb. Okay, he said, I said what millions of Americans were thinking. Now, that actually has some degree of truth to it, unfortunately, because uh, it is nowhere near the majority of Americans. But there are, there is, there's 330 million people in the country, and there is some percentage who think, come on, man. Not that police brutality is not that bad, and they, a lot of them might think that, and a lot of them might say that. But for most of them, I think that they think, I just don't want to hear about it, because it's not my problem. I mean, it's, if it's your 12-year-old son getting shot in a park in two seconds flat, uh, well, that's your problem, not my problem. I still want to hear about it. It makes me uncomfortable, right? If it's uh, disproportionately African-Americans who were shot, even though they didn't have any weapons at all, even though in some of the cases they're complying with police, and even though statistically it's worse, I don't want to hear about it. And unfortunately, that is true for a lot of Americans. Well, at least it was true on the, until Donald Trump came in, and now the whole country is hearing about it. Because he was, he bungled it so badly that he's turned hundreds of millions of Americans against him. So, but he can't stop. He's going to double down further here. Let's go to video one, where he's asked about it today. I think this is actually literally his fifth time uh, doubling down. So, is this quintupling down? Let's watch. Well, I wasn't preoccupied with the NFL. I was. Uh ashamed of what was taking place because to me that was a very important moment. I don't think you can disrespect our country, our flag, our national anthem. Uh, to me, the NFL situation is a very important situation. I've heard that before about was I preoccupied? Not at all. Not at all. I have plenty of time on my hands. All I do is work. Uh, don't say I have plenty of time on my tiny little hands. <laughs> You're supposed to be focusing on Puerto Rico. You've know, got devastation down there, and he's like, I got plenty of time on my hands, so I can go around picking fights with the NFL. Oh, and all I do is work. We see you golfing every weekend! We have TV cameras, we can see it, we have eyes. He's not done yet. It doesn't take me long to put out a wrong, and maybe we will get it right. I think it's a very important thing for the NFL to not allow people to kneel during the playing of our national anthem, to respect our country and to respect our flag. <laughs> the other dude there is like, what am I doing? Who am I? Why am I here? Please make the paint stop. <laughs> okay. Anyway, when the president, the leader of the government, says that people should be made to kneel or fired if they kneel and should be forced to not speak their minds, we have a significant constitutional issue. If the teams on their own decide to take action, that's private action. When Trump does it, it's public action. And we're supposed to have freedom of speech in this country. He's basically saying if you exercise your freedom of speech, you should be fired. It's a massive problem. It's gotten so bad. I'm going to go to video three here. Even Kilmeade might have turned on him. <gasps> Watch. The, the, with a president, and I understand his sentiment, made things so much worse. And the language he used was terrible. When you have Robert Kraft coming out against you, you know you've gone too far. Robert Kraft spends time in the Lincoln bedroom. He's friends with President Trump beyond their, their wealth and their riches and their circles. He made things immeasurably worse by speaking out. And I know what his intention was, but the language used was, was just, it was galvanizing the wrong direction. He made things immeasurably worse. Even Fox and Friends were saying that. You've lost Kill Me, you've lost Kraft, you've lost Jerry Jones. What do you have left? But another one! He puts out a tweet. The NFL has all sorts of rules and regulations. The only way out for them is to set a rule that you can't kneel during your national anthem. 
He is now saying, as the leader of the government, you should not allow it, and it is your only way out. He has no idea what's in our Constitution. He doesn't know anything about this country. He doesn't know about our principles. All he cares about is himself. He's such a buffoon. And so when the NFL was asked about it, Joe Lockhart, that's the NFL's executive vice president of communications and public affairs, talked about how everyone in the locker room was united against Donald Trump's comments. And then he had this nice little comment. He said, everyone should know, including the president, this is what real locker room talk is. Damn, nice little reference. The Access Hollywood tapes from the campaign. Shots fired. Uh, and friendly fire. Trump is a disaster. He's not winning with this strategy. In this case, quite literally. Okay. Uh, now, we turn to Puerto Rico for a second and his reaction to that. Okay. So a lot of folks are concerned that uh, Puerto Rico is in terrible shape and Donald Trump's too obsessed with the NFL. Uh, let me give you an update on Puerto Rico. Uh, the mayor of San Juan uh, said just yesterday we've been canvassing one by one, uh, uh, all of our elderly homes finding our elderly, and I'm not kidding, we had to transfer 11 of them in near-death conditions, no food, no water, no electricity, and really the sanitary conditions were deplorable. Uh, HuffPost goes on to explain hospitals and care centers uh, for the disabled are running out of diesel, uh, crews at it, that's the mayor of San Juan. Certain hospital patients, Reuters reported, have been evacuated to the U.S., but others await an uncertain fate as generators fail. So things are in a horrible condition there. Already 16 people have died in Puerto Rico alone, um, and uh, there are 10,000 people in shelters as we speak. Diesel fuel sent to Puerto Rico from the U.S. is 124,000 gallons because they need that for the generators. Otherwise, people's lives are endangered in the hospitals and other places. People of potential danger, if a dam in Puerto Rico fails, is 70,000 people um, in this very significant life-threatening danger. But remember, power and communication is out throughout the island, so they might not even know it. Uh, and you're seeing pictures there, and you're not going to be surprised after the pictures to find out that 80% of the crops have been damaged, and there's been $780 million loss in agricultural yields. And what is Donald Trump's mm. response, Ben? Well, uh, he tweeted these bizarre tweets uh, a little while ago. So Texas and Florida are doing great, but Puerto Rico, which was already suffering from broken infrastructure and massive debt, is in deep trouble. Why would you phrase it that way? Look, I, I don't think he's doing it consciously, but I think he thinks, you know, Puerto Ricans, they were already in debt. They were already a mess. Texas and Florida are doing great. Ay, ay, ay. Just go help them! You're the president! Yes, Puerto Rico is a United States territory! He got heat for all these tweets. I'll tell you his reaction in a second, but let me give you the other two. He said, its old electrical grid, which was in terrible shape, was devastated. Much of the island was destroyed with billions of dollars owed to Wall Street and the banks, which sadly must be uh, dealt with. Food, water, and medical are top priorities and doing well. Hashtag people. Do you think that he's bringing up the Wall Street debt as a, like, hey, that's outrageous that Wall Street um, um, has got them over a barrel here when they're suffering? Or that, hey, uh, Puerto Rico has different rules for how to handle their debt than the rest of the United States of America, and that's fundamentally unfair. First of all, there's no way he even knows that. No, it appears that in the context of those tweets, he's saying, like, <laughs> they already owed all this money to Wall Street. These Puerto Ricans, I don't know what I'm going to do with them. Just have, but he can't. He can't have sympathy or empathy for anyone he doesn't associate with. And so I, I don't know if that's a look. Some people are not going to want to call that racist, but it's that's fine. You can call whatever you like. But he has empathy for people who look like him and who are in his circles, and and more than even racial, which in this case I think there's plenty of that going on here. Uh, and you can make your own judgment call on it or not. I'm giving you all the facts here. But it's, like you said about his cabinet, he said, look, I put rich people in my cabinet. I don't want poor people in my government. Because he thinks rich people are successful and good people. 
poor people. They owe money to Wall Street. You owe money to Wall Street. He went bankrupt six different times. But he thinks, no, that's okay. I've always been among the rich. So I'm a good guy. And, and others, uh, they're, they're, they're not winning. They're not winning. They're a mess. Don't call. He's in essence calling them a mess here. And of course, with no sense of self uh, and irony or any of that stuff, to know that he actually was known as the king of debt. But of course, his daddy bailed him out over and over again, and apparently at one point, so did the Russians. So I guess he thinks that's okay. As long as maybe he's going to call the Russians and get them to help Puerto Rico. Anyway, since he took a lot of criticism for that, he put out a statement later today saying, no, 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 no. Puerto Rico, the quote, is very important to me. And Puerto Rico, the, the people are fantastic people. I grew up in New York, so I know many people from Puerto Rico. I know many Puerto Ricans. And these people are great people. And we have to help them. The island is devastated. See, some of my best friends are Puerto Ricans. I, I mean, I lived in New York. I mean, they're not really my friends, but I saw Puerto Ricans in New York. Great people, great people. No, 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 I'm going to go help them. And he finally said he is going to go down there and visit. He just didn't want to get in the way earlier. No, I'm kidding. Make of it what you will, but it doesn't seem like it's a top priority. Okay, last uh, story for you guys. So-called first hour. Okay. So we've had a red wedding, and we know how that turns out. That won't turn out well. But there are uh, weddings that turn out great. Red, white, and blue weddings. What in the world is that? Now, I'm going to argue that this is one of the best weddings in America. Uh, I'm going to show you a little video of it, and you're going to go, what's going on here? Okay? Right. Seems innocuous enough. Let me show you the, the lovely wedding here, and then I will tell you why this lovely couple, uh, I think, did something incredibly patriotic, and why I want to give them credit. Let's watch. Today is one of life's happiest occasions. But marriage involves many emotions, good and not so good. Be each other's support system. You will have all of us to lean on as well, but on a day-to-day -day basis, you will need each other. Listen, be patient, communicate your needs, and don't forget that friendship is one of the foundations of your relationship. Friendship, laughter, and love. Now you might think that looks like a lovely wedding, but a fairly normal one. Wrong. Uh, those American heroes are Justin Hayashi and Rebecca Chan. Um, you know what they said to their guests? They said, don't give us any gifts. Instead, uh, please give at wolf-pack.com slash wedding. I'm not kidding. So they asked every guest to give to Wolfpack instead. How much do I love these guys? So they got no gifts for their wedding. Uh, all they got was people giving to a cause that they really believe in, uh, which is to, of course, get money out of politics so we end the corruption in this country. So that the people aren't just represented by the elite anymore, uh, but that the Americans can have a true voice. And so I, I was moved by that. They visited here as well. And I thought, you know what? Why, why don't we... Uh, not only thank them, but take it up a notch. So they've already raised thousands for Wolfpack, but can I say a hundred thousand? How amazing would that be if it turns out their wedding registry raised a hundred thousand dollars for an amazing cause? By the way, a cause that ninety-three percent of Americans agree with. They ninety-three percent of Americans say that politicians represent their donors over their voters, and they're absolutely right about that. But could you imagine caring enough about that to make that the focus of your wedding, at least your wedding registry? Wow, what wonderful, thoughtful people. Wolf-pack.com slash wedding. Go donate to uh, uh, their, not just their cause, but to their wedding and to their lovely gesture. So, gesture. So, Justin and Rebecca, wonderful job. In fact, Wolfpack got together and they wanted to thank them at their latest uh, gathering. So since this is some of the state leaders, and I want to show you their thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I love America. I love Americans. This is what we do together. So make it a special one. Make it the most special wedding uh, that anybody's ever had. So thank you guys for doing that. And by the way, if you want to do it too, I'm
look, I know it's a big thing, and it's, it's that's why it's bold, and that's why they're great. Um, but and it doesn't have to be a wedding. It could be a quinceanera. It could be a bar mitzvah. I don't know. Together at Wolf dash pack dot com if you uh, want to do this as well. So uh, let Wolf Pack know, and they'll set it up for you. Together at Wolf dash pack dot com. And like I said, go to wolf packcom slash wedding and donate to uh, this great American couple's wedding and to their cause. Uh, let's get an amendment. Let's make it worthwhile. So can you imagine we pass that amendment? They get to say, hey, look, we were a huge part of it. And that would be absolutely true. And I see $100,000 in my wedding registry. All right, guys. I love you. Uh, we're going to take a quick break here. Uh, when we come back, uh, we've got a lot more stories for you guys, uh, including Trump supporters turning on him over the NFL and Puerto Rico issue. Wow, that's interesting. You'll love their quotes. Come right back. <laughs>
they're okay or not. Yeah, and look, I... I just brought up they can't charge their phones. And that sounds frivolous, but remember, their power grid is completely knocked out, which means that their landlines aren't working, and the only way that they can maybe communicate is if uh, they can use their cell phones in a specific location. Um, and get the reception necessary to uh, reach out to people. So To find out if their family yeah. and loved ones are okay or not, and to vote for the Young Turks as hashtag QIT for stream. What? <laughs> Is that if that's inappropriate, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> realizing what we were saying all along, but they're not, their job is not politics or to do a show, so they weren't knee deep in it. They just saw, hey, that guy's talking like a real human being versus the other one that's talking like a robot and the establishment and a regular politician I can't stand. 
So what they missed was his incompetence. That's why I did the Loser Donald segment. That's why I did a hundred different stories, literally before the election, to tell you how incompetent he is. I didn't talk about what a bad guy he was. I talked about what a loser he is. And now that's his uh, supporters going, I didn't know he wasn't going to get anything accomplished. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, now, in the next video, they specifically address Donald Trump's tweets to NFL players who refused to stand during the national anthem. How many of you are comfortable with the president weighing in on what's happening during the national anthem and some players taking a knee? Are you happy that the president talked about it this weekend or tweeted about it? Nobody's happy that the president weighed in. I think that these players have the First Amendment. Right to kneel during the national anthem or sit out, and it's just an argument that really did need to be picked, and now it's what everybody's talking about when there are so many other things that we could be talking about, like the hurricane in Puerto Rico. So why is President Trump weighing in on this? I think it's because he loves America. I don't like the disrespect that these players are showing, but on the other hand, as my husband and I both say, we may not like it. But my husband served 21 years. My brother-in-law died in service to guarantee both the NFL players' rights to free speech and the president's right of free speech. I'm a son of and a grandson of veterans, and I was always taught that I might not like what you say, but I'll defend to the death your right to say it. And that's what the First Amendment's about, and that's what this country's about. Oh, my God, that made me feel so good. Yeah, um, yeah, you see that? So there's much hope. respect for Kathy Gibson especially, right? Like, yeah. you don't have to like it, but you're right. I mean, that's what our soldiers fight for, to maintain democracy and freedom in this country. And that's what they're doing. They're practicing their First Amendment rights. Um, having the president urge NFL owners or, or team owners to fire them is crazy. Yeah, so, look, for the, Peyton, uh, the guy on the, on the left side, Remember, he was the one that's in favor of the travel, what he calls the travel ban, which is in reality a Muslim ban. Um, it's not like he didn't sign on for discriminatory policies, but he's not like Trump, where Trump is actively racist. And, and that's the whole point, whether it's the travel ban or attacking black players for uh, being against police brutality, etc. Peyton is like, well, and they're... Well, I don't get it. They're Americans. They do get to have their opinion, right? right? So even if some people might be in favor of discriminatory policies I don't agree with, they, still their heart might not be in the wrong place, and we have to keep an open mind about that, too. Right. Well, they're certainly not anywhere near where Donald Trump is in terms of actively disliking these different groups and, and working against them. Absolutely. And, and just one uh, comment in regards to the guy that you were talking about who's in favor of the Muslim ban. Um, you know, I got to give him credit for bringing up the issue of Puerto Rico because, you know, and, and this is my bad, this is my fault, my bias, but I would have just assumed that Trump voters don't care about Puerto Rico. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so to hear someone who voted for Trump and who supported Trump say that, it just shows you, you know, the human side that, you know, oftentimes the media does get dehumanized, dehumanized. Um, because of some of the more hateful rhetoric that they've supported from Trump. You know what I mean? Yeah, saying? yeah. In fact, uh, he um, he said in another part of the interview that he was he didn't understand why Trump was more eager to attack the black NFL players than neo Nazis. Yeah, that's a great point. It's a great point. And when Alison Camerata asked, "Why do you think that is?" he said, "Quote: I wish I knew." It completely baffles me. Uh, and then um, Mark O'Brien, uh, uh, one of the guys you just saw there, said about him talking about the NFL in instead of criticizing neo-Nazis, he says, that is a huge concern of mine. What is going on in that man's mind? So th this is really heartening. Uh, because more so than, hey, we're going to get him politically and all that, Talk. No, no, no. It's it's encouraging to see that, yes, still at the end of the day, some Republican voters, mm -hmm. uh, unlike Trump, do understand the point of the country. They do understand that we can disagree, but still 
to respect the freedom of speech and respect other races Absolutely. and be unified against things like neo-Nazis. Of course! Of course that should be the case. But with Trump, you know, when it, after Trump, so it's like, I mean, there are good people on both sides. He hasn't even said there are good people on both sides of the kneeling issue. Yeah. He just calls them sons of bitches and says they should be fired. It's crazy. It, it is absolutely nuts, and it's good to see that, that really conservative Americans are saying, hey, we get it. We know what this country is about, and it is diversity of opinion, and we're all allowed to have our opinions, and it's weird that the president doesn't understand that. All right, moving on to other news. There's been quite a bit of backlash against NFL players who protested Donald Trump's statements on Twitter in regard to those who refused to stand during the national anthem. Now, uh, one example of that was when Patriots players uh, decided to kneel instead of stand uh, after Trump's tweets. These are players who just stood for the most of the time and then realized, okay, well, we need to unite and we need to support those who want to kneel. Well, uh, Stephen Pena, who is a public official in Brockton, Massachusetts, said some pretty negative things about Patriot players who joined in on the protest. Now, he's with the Parks and Recreation Commission, and uh, he left a comment on a Facebook story about kneeling Patriot players in which he referred to them as turds for taking a knee during the national anthem. But it gets worse. He says... Uh, Turds, your dumbass isn't paid to think about politics. Dance, monkey dance. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now, again, this is a public official, right? In Brockton, Massachusetts, he's with Parks and Recreation. Uh, he got quite a bit of backlash after he made those statements on a public forum online. And so he just wants to make sure he clarifies what he meant by monkey. He didn't mean for it to be racist. He says it was not meant to be a racist comment. And if it was taken as such, that's regrettable. Okay, so look, it, it is, there is a small percentage chance that this guy is totally clueless and doesn't know that is a, a derogatory comment uh, aimed at African Americans a great majority of the time. Um, so, but even if, it, even if we grant him that, which I don't, I think it's a small chance that he, that he uh, made an honest mistake. Um, even if you were to grant him that, though, so your thing is, okay, so if you are an entertainer of any sort, you're my monkey. And so you're, unlike other Americans, like plumbers and guys who take care of parks, you're not allowed to have an opinion, and you're not allowed to be concerned that maybe your kids are going to get shot when they're unarmed, like it happened to Tamir Rice in Cleveland. Uh, you're not allowed to participate in the process because you're there for the entertainment of this uh, Stephen your guy, right. and and so you're supposed to dance for him like a monkey. So it's such an asshole thing to say it, any way you slice it. I just feel like, you know, the people who are up in arms and make these types of statements online just fundamentally misunderstand what this country is supposed to be about, right? Political activism, political discourse, I mean, that is the heart of democracy. Making sure that people feel free to, to speak their mind and say what they need to say about a particular political issue. They, they don't want that. They want to shut them up. So are you not in favor of free speech? Are you not in favor of a democratic system where people are able to take part in voting and voicing their opinions and engaging in this type of rhetoric? It's crazy to me. And if you didn't know that the great majority of the athletes doing it are black and that that's a derogatory thing to say about blacks and that, that might get you in trouble, you also haven't shown very good judgment as a public official. But wait, it's about to get much worse, not for him, but for the next guy. Yes, okay. So uh, then there's the issue of a volunteer fire chief in Pittsburgh. Um, he was upset because of the Steelers protesting. Now, the Steelers did something a little different from the Patriots. They decided to stay in the tunnel during the national anthem instead of coming out and standing during the national anthem. And so uh, Paul Smith, who is a volunteer uh, firefighter at uh, the Cecil Volunteer Fire Station number 2, posted a derogatory response on Facebook, which was directed at Mike Tomlin. He's the head coach. And he used a racial slur. So I'm not going to say the racial slur. You guys know what it is. But I will read you uh, his comment. He says, Tomlin just added himself to the list of no good N-words. Yes, I said it. So he seemed pretty proud of his statement there. Thought it was bold. 
So let's pause there for a second before his eventual backpedal so he, you know, he doesn't get himself in trouble. Um, first, um, and no good N-word. Um, no lack of clarity here. Okay. I know that, like, no matter what anybody says, people are always like, but maybe, they, well, no, but maybe it was a racist. I mean, that was <laughs> as clear as you can possibly get. There's no way to spin that. Yeah. And, and so... Remember that the pre players are protesting in the first place because they're treated as less than equal. And and part of uh, the idea here is Black Lives Matter. So here, here's a guy saying, oh yeah, you're a no good N-word. So thereby validating the idea that some people think that, that your life isn't equal. Uh, exactly. And, and so there's just no lack of clarity. But the second part that's am amazing is He's a fire chief, he's a public guy, he says this publicly on Facebook, and feels emboldened to say it. Like, it's okay, I can come out of the closet now. And he adds, yes, I said it, take that, you N-words. Now, I mean, what, what are we supposed to do here? Are we supposed to have understanding for them? It's crazy. So, I mean, what if they, they're going into uh, a situation where there's a fire in an African-American's house? Is he not going to want to rescue them because they're no good N-words? That's right. So that's, you know, look, the reason why these stories matter, and it's not random private citizens. These are public officials. In this case, we're talking about a fire chief. And if he perceives a certain group of people as less than, as not as important, as not as valuable to society, then does that impact the way he does his job? You know, and... and you're talking about people's lives here, and, and that's the reason why it really stood out to me. And it, again, it was so clear. What he said was clear. There wasn't any, you know, there was, he can't use the same excuse that the initial person that we talked about used, where it's like, oh, I didn't know that monkeys was a negative way to refer to black people. In this case, you know the N-word is not the way that you should refer to black people. You know that that's offensive, beyond offensive. Yeah, and before we get to his non-apology, uh, he's a fire chief, so... Whether he does it consciously or maybe just subconsciously, is he less likely to send people in a harm's way into a fire, which is their job, right. which is an amazing job, by the way. And my uh, nephew is a volunteer uh, firefighter, too, and it's a hell of a job. But is he maybe going to take less of a chance if it's an African-American household as opposed to a white household? Well, if he thinks that you're not equal, maybe. And then if your kids die because of, no, no, we can't have that. That's crazy. So now he's not apology. He says, uh, I am embarrassed uh, at this. I want to apologize. I was frustrated and angry at the Steelers not standing the anthem. This had nothing to do with my fire department. I regret what I said. But here's the thing. There have been countless times where I've been angry. Let's say at a story that we're covering. And my initial reaction isn't to talk about their race or say something disparaging about their ethnicity, their race, their background. Um, have I said offensive things about certain people? Absolutely. But my mind just doesn't go there. The fact that his mind immediately went to no good N-word, I mean, there's no excuse for that. Yeah. So there's a thousand ways to attack people, and, uh, and we would know. <laughs> but attacking them based on their race makes no sense at all. So, and look, here, he says, I regret what I said. Well, then, hey, Jake, is that an apology? No, it just means I regret I got in trouble for it. Remember, here, his original comment was, yeah, I said it. Yeah. And now all of a sudden, oh, I regret what I said because he's embarrassed by it. And then he, but the thing that annoyed me the most was, uh, I, I don't want, this had nothing to do with my fire department. Yeah, we know that. Uh, we're not putting it on your fire department. We're putting we're not, it on you as the fire chief who probably shouldn't be a fire chief. Do you know why he's saying that? Because he's hiding behind the fire department. Because nobody was criticizing your fire department. We were criticizing you. So when you say, I don't want this to be on the fire department, in other words, remember, I'm with the fire department, okay? And it's not fair to blame them. Well, nobody's doing that, so problem solved, okay? So, yes, these guys exist, man. And if you're not black, you could be outraged by it, and we're outraged by it, and, and that shows that you have empathy. God bless your heart. But even if you're, if you're in that category or not in that category, just think for a second. If you're a black in this country and you know a certain percentage of the police chiefs and the fire chiefs and the guys who you know drive ambulances and the list goes on and on, 
don't think that you're equal to other people. And they think that your life doesn't matter as much. But don't complain about it. Okay? Don't don't protest in the streets. That would be inconvenient for people. And don't be peaceful in your protest either where you just kneel during the national anthem. Just don't don't complain. You're not allowed to. Yeah. That's that's their take. I, I even hesitate talking about it to some degree because I feel that it's so depressing. And but look, the way that we're gonna get past it is to talk about it and and to tackle this and to solve this as a country together. Because it is unacceptable for a certain percentage of Americans to think I might not get rescued because of what that guy thinks about my whole race. That is that is very, very unfortunate and unfortunately true for a percentage of Americans. But let's all get better together and the way you do it is first recognize the problem. And thank God for Colin Kaepernick, because he helped to highlight this issue, which leads to more people recognizing the problem. Unfortunately, these guys and Donald Trump, our president, are not among the people who recognize it. But uh, but at least I think a majority of Americans do, and at least now a majority of the NFL does. Okay, we got to take a break. Uh, when we come back, we've got a lot more stories for you guys, uh, including cops who are being reprimanded for being against cop brutality. Okay, when we return. It's the post game show. Brett Ehrlich and Tim Horcher join me. I think there's a, an interesting thing to be written or done about the logic of repealing EPA regulations because that is baby killing. Yeah, yeah. Like you're a baby killer. Like everything you're doing is aborting babies. And you can go specifically to like Monsanto and um, and, and with pesticides that yeah. end up creating birth defects that abort babies. So in a way, that is an abortion clinic that you're starting by repealing um, FDA uh, regulations and EPA regulations. That's right. But we we know what they really mean when they say that they're pro life. Right. And that's what that's the that's the thing for me is like I just I'm tired of everyone speaking in code and rushing to like confirm their pre-existing biases. I just want them to tell me what they're actually pissed about. Mm -hmm. Like it seems like with the, the things that we were talking about on one show that were like, people are okay with Trump having his own private server. Yeah. It's like, well, you got mad at someone else for oh, that. her which, emails. Right. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, so, okay, it's fine. You know your bullshit. I know your bullshit. So tell me what you're actually mad about because it's probably your dad. Yeah. Like, it's probably your mom and your dad and that's why you're mad and it's created this crazy shit from this probably very personal relationship you have with your parents. Mm -hmm. And I get it. And it's and you're angry and frustrated and you're talking in strange codes and giving certain people passes and other people not. You read headlines and articles in this sprint to find some way to confirm what you already believe. Yeah. And you stop when you get it and you don't read the end of it. Like, I get it, but tell me what you're actually mad about. Can we? Okay, you know what? This is a good therapeutic exercise to close out the post-game show. Why don't we each... Um, state what we are the most angry about. I'm the most angry about uh, boycotts right now. Oh. Just like, oh, boycott it, that thing's the worst. Like, if I were in to get into a business right now, it would be litmus paper sales. Uh-huh. Because everyone's like, litmus test on that, litmus test on that, fuck you, fuck you, boycott, delete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, read the history of boycotts, which ones are good, and which ones are like, you weren't going to buy that shit anyway. I am angry about w willful ignorance. I am angry yes. about throwing away data that we have applied intellectual power to uh, for a reason. I am tired of the rejection of intellectualism or deciding that intellectual people are elitist or somehow they think yes. they're better than you. Maybe they are. They know things. And you should try to know things about something. Yes. Forcing yourself into the dark is never going to bring us forward. It's never going to end up with a positive result. <laughs>
Black and Mayor Church, Jake and Anna with you guys. Joshua Capo Vader writes in, Anna is Bay every single day. Oh my God, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> That's very nice. John Connor writes in, uh, I'm thinking Anna can experience dress for a later function. Hashtag good luck TYT. Hashtag TYT for streamies. Um, yes, I am. A lot of people are commenting on my hair. Thank you for the nice comments, but don't get used to it because this took way too much time to do. Someone was like, oh, Anna's hairstylist needs a raise, which means me. Oh, okay. All right. Yes. <laughs> well, we do many jobs at once here. Um, yes, uh, we are going to go away. Like I said earlier in the show, we're going to present for a storyteller of the year, which is kind of cool. I'm not, I'm not sure I've ever presented for an award before. Neither have I. And, uh, and then we're up for show of the year. Hashtag TRT for streamies voting still going on. And that's how you vote, through Twitter, uh, by doing hashtag TYT for streamies. Okay. Uh, member shout-outs, David Stowe and Kimberly and Cunningham. Thank you, guys. We appreciate it. You get the whole show, of course, ad-free. If you're a member, tytnetwork.com slash join. And uh, today, since we got to run to the streamies, uh, Steve and Dave are going to give you an extra post game. Okay, which is uh, awesome. All right. Uh, what's next, guys? All right. Two police officers in Chicago have been officially reprimanded after a photo featuring them went viral online. Now, in the photo, uh, they are shown kneeling in solidarity with NFL players who also kneel during the national anthem. And this whole story came about when an activist approached them and asked if they supported people like Colin Kaepernick. So the officers were approached by an acti uh, activist named uh, Arlita Clark, who asked the two officers whether they were opposed to police brutality and racism. They responded in the affirmative, knelt down in solidarity with uh, Clark Kaepernick and the broader message. So that was what you saw in that photo was posted on Instagram, went viral, and for the most part, got a lot of support. But after enough people saw it, of course, there are going to be some who are opposed to it, and the police department was notified of the image, and they released a statement indicating that these police officers would be reprimanded. Now, um, I also want to be clear that the department does have a pretty strict policy when it comes to partisan political speech while on duty, they are obviously in uniform, and they made uh, a political statement, and so that's the reason that the department is giving for reprimanding them. Uh, department members are prohibited from participating in any partisan political campaign or activity while on duty, including but not limited to distributing campaign literature or wearing uh, or displaying political paraphernalia. Now, uh, the official statement from the department is as follows. We are aware of the photo and we will address it in the same way we have handled previous incidents in which officers have made political statements while in uniform with a reprimand and a reminder of department policies. Okay, so I'm a little split on this. I mean, I get it. They have a policy. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, and at the end of the day, it's a reprimand and a reminder of department policies. Yeah, live, I know. Okay. It's, uh, some people are mistaking that as these officers getting fired. They're, they're not, not getting they're fired. Not fired. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, on the other hand, they're not really doing political paraphernalia. It, it's not like they're saying vote for Bob or Susie or Republican or Democrat. It easily could have been interpreted as not a political statement. And then think about what the statement is. It's against police brutality and their police. I hope that all the cops agree that they're against police brutality. So if that's against your guidelines to be in favor, to be against police brutality, uh, then I'm a little worried about your guidelines. It's super easy to say that's not a political statement. Of course, we're all against police brutality. Yes. Look, I, I hate zero tolerance policies. I think that, you know, once you put out a zero tolerance policy in regard to political speech, and, you know, you're talking about public officials putting forth a policy that squashes political speech. I mean, I don't know if you can have a debate about whether or not this is protected by the First Amendment. I get the idea, though, that, hey, we need to have a policy in place because we might have some police officers who say things that lead to the community further distrusting them. Right. And so we've had a number of stories where police have said things that were horrible toward the black community or those who have been protesting. And that unfortunately, not unfortunately, understandably leads to the community not trusting them. 
However, like in this case, I feel like this is something that should be protected, right? It, it seems like the only time cops get reprimanded or, or face a punishment is when they criticize other cops or call out other cops. And I think right now, more than ever, we need the good cops to come forward and be like, you know what? No, we're not going to stand for this. All of these, you know, murders uh, against people who are unarmed, we're not going to stand for this. We got we to gotta change the policing. We got to change the training. That's what we've been asking for. And now finally we have these two cops who made a mild statement by kneeling in a photo and, you know, they get reprimanded. So, uh, look, I, I totally agree with the policy overall. I don't want a cop showing up in a MAGA hat. Right? Right. I also don't want a cop showing up with a I'm with her uh, sticker, okay? Or even a Bernie So Punk t-shirt, which you can get at shoptyt.com. Um, but because what if, you know, some people are made uncomfortable. They they did, they weren't with her. Or, you know, it's a, a, a very wealthy person's house, and they wrongly are made uncomfortable by Bernie Sanders, and they're not sure the cop is on their side. We can't have it. I totally agree that you should leave po politics out of it. Uh, but Kaepernick taking a knee and doing, uh, you know, raising their fist, and all the players now doing it, and even some of NFL owners doing it, are not saying we're against cops. They're not saying we're against any race, certainly, right? They're saying we want to make sure that everybody's treated equally, yep. and that uh, and that we don't have police brutality. Especially if you're the police, you gotta agree with that message, right? And so, and, and the last thing is, that a lot of people have a wrong impression of cops. Uh, so uh, they think, for example, we're against cops. That's crazy. We talked about it a million times. We want better training for cops because there are cops, and then we want them to protect the community, all of the community, and we want them uh, trained better to do that so they don't shoot as quickly, etc. Right? And and then some on the right think, oh, the cops don't like you guys. I'm sure that's true for some of the cops, but that's actually not at all true for a lot of the cops. Mm -hmm. I know from my personal life, I mean, cops are uh, shouting out at me all the time, <laughs> but not in that way. Uh, no. So, and they'll be like, hey, Young Turks, hey, I watch your show, hey, keep going. Uh, in yeah. D.C., in New York, in L.A., uh, in, in D.C., when I got arrested for civil disobedience to get money out of politics, as I was going to do the paperwork, one of the cops was like, Young Turks, keep her going. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now, I don't want to go to somebody else's house and say that, because that would be political, right. right? But, so, not all cops are alike. That's a ridiculous way of thinking on either side, right? Right. Great to, I love to see them doing this, saying we're against police brutality. I wish the department was a little bit more understanding of it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just one comment in regard to cops liking us or not liking us. Uh, I... It's not our job to care about cops liking us, right? It's our job to do the best we can with these stories and, and be honest with you guys and give you the facts. Um, but I have a tremendous amount of respect for the cops that, you know, watch the show, see uh, some of the criticisms that we've had in regard to police training, and they've been, you know, receptive to it and understanding. So much love to them. All right, uh, moving on to something completely different. College basketball drama. That's what's happening right now. Bribes, corruption, a lot of shady dealings. And uh, apparently a bunch of people have been charged in a federal corruption case. Let me give you the details. Uh, the people in, implicated in this case uh, involve coaches at Auburn, Oklahoma State, Arizona, and Southern California. And they were all accused of accepting bribes in exchange for offering to steer players to preferred financial advisors, business managers, and agents. Now, uh, the attorney uh, who is, uh, you know, essentially investigating this case had a press conference where he kind of specified, you know, the weight of these charges. So I want to just quickly show you that video and then I'll fill in the blanks. Coaches at some of the nation's top programs soliciting and accepting cash bribes. Managers and financial advisors circling blue chip prospects like coyotes and employees of one of the world's largest sportswear companies secretly funneling cash to the families of high school recruits. In all, we have charged 10 people in three separate complaints. Four college basketball coaches, three people associated with professional managers and advisors, and three with ties to the major sportswear company, including its global marketing director for basketball. 
These men allegedly participated in two different, two different but related schemes. In the first, college coaches took cash bribes from managers and advisors in exchange for directing players and their families to those bribers. In the second scheme, managers, advisors, and those affiliated with the sportswear company worked together to funnel money to families of some of the country's top high school recruits, upwards of $100,000, for the player's commitment to play for the schools sponsored by that company. Okay, so that's what's going on. Um Keep in mind that these players are not allowed to get paid while they're in college. They're not considered professional athletes. It, this whole situation is frustrating because a lot of people make a lot of money off of these athletes, but they're not allowed to make any money. And then there is, you know, this shady stuff going on behind the scenes to try to ensure that the talented players go to these specific universities and that they sign with specific brands. In this case, Adidas, a top Adidas executive and two associates were accused of arranging illicit payments for high school stars and their families to secure athlete commitments to Adidas sponsored schools. So uh, first reaction is uh, relieved to find out the Justice Department is still uh, working. <laughs> so, and I say that not in regards to busting the players or even the coaches, but there was a company involved, Adidas, yeah. and they still actually did an investigation and got them. And look, uh, even under Obama, that didn't happen that often, or not as often as it should have. Uh, and under Trump, they, we just did a story yesterday where it was in regards to banks and not sneaker companies, but they were basically like, we're just going to let them police themselves. Right. So when you see the Justice Department doing a good investigation, finding out something going wrong, bribery, and actually doing something about it, I feel like, yes, okay, a little bit of justice. Um, and, and it's amazing how lucrative these deals are because in just one of the incidents, an assistant coach got $91,500 to, uh, to direct the players to a financial advisor. So that financial advisor is going to make so much more money off those players later that the $91,000 is a small percentage to give. And that was just one of the bribes to that guy. So there's a lot of money at stake here, which then finally leads me to the point that Anna was making, which is that it's outrageous that they're not making money in the first place, which leads to problems like this. Right. Because there's so much money to be had here that if you bottle it up and you make it illegal, it's going to just flow out in terms of bribery, etc., so, so, look, I know what a lot of guys think. What difference does it make? They're going to go to the NBA and make millions anyway. No, not all of them. So the NCAA's profit and the college's profit and CBS and all the other networks profit from all their play, and only a small percentage of those guys make it to the NBA. Those guys provided entertainment and didn't get paid anything for it. The scholarships are great, wonderful, but, but it's, it's not fair. They didn't get the, the salaries that they could have gotten if it was a professional sport, and even for the guys who make it, some of them get injured. Right. So they spent their best years in college, and they never got paid for it. Exactly. So, so many people are making money off of them. And yeah, scholarships are great if you want to go to college for free, and that was what your objective was, right? But for a lot of them, their goal is to be in the NBA. And in this case, it's just, the whole thing is annoying and crazy. And I, and I get that they make a lot of money for the schools, However, it also costs the schools a lot of money, especially when you consider how much the head coaches make and all that. Anyway, we got to go. All right, guys. Much love. Wolf-pack.com slash wedding. Already 3,000 raised. More soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>
He is back.